firebird might have crossed the last blue mountain. Yet, the fire remains. He touched the sky, and it smiled. He stretched out his arms, and they encircled the globe. His vision made giants out of men and organizations. Power he had, but remained untouched by it. With a smile that he shared with the world, J.R.D. was on a mission, dreaming of India being a joyous land, an economic power. J.R.D. had no illusions about making India a superpower. He, he wanted India to be prosperous. Above all, I think he wanted the people of India to be happy. 29th of July, 1904. The conqueror of the world, Jahangir, Ratanji Dada Boy Tata, was born. The architect of a new India had arrived to measure the open skies and the unexplored vastness beyond. JRD, as he was affectionately known to so many across the country, straddled the 20th century as one of India's most enterprising business leaders. JRD was not just a businessman. He was a great dreamer, a great builder, a great humanist, above all, a true patriot. JRD's father was Indian and his mother French. He belonged to the world, but carried India in his heart. A lover of humanity, whatever he touched, he adorned. There was no man behind a man. There was only a man, and that was J.R.D. The story of the Tatars dates back to historic times. 1839 was the year Jamsekji Nusarvanji Tata was born into a family of Parsi priests in Navsari, Gujarat. He was a visionary, an industrialist who dreamt of ushering India into the age of the Industrial Revolution. He conceived India's first steel plant, the University of Science, and the first hydroelectric project. The Tata family is an exceptional family. They were, of course, among the first industrialists in India. And the country owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to the entire family, but Jyadi Tata himself was well, a very remarkable person. In 1887, Jamsetji established Tata and Sons. His partners were his eldest son, Dorabji, and Jamsetji's youngest son, Ratan, became a partner a few years later. R.D.'s father, Dada boy Tata, was Jamsetji's brother-in-law. The Tata family tree was one comprising stalwarts. A fragrant megare of that great man who industrialized the country will abide with us now and forever. My acquaintance with the J.R.D. Tata started when I joined the Planning Commission about three decades ago. Jamsetji passed away in 1904. In that very year, a grandson was born to Dada boy. This child was J.R.D., destined to carry forward Jamsetji's vision to the whole wide world. J.R.D. was a great man. He, is a, he was a father of the Indian Industrial Revolution, conceptually as well as practically. Of course, uh, it is uh, Jamshedji who had uh, the dreams of making India an inter industrialized nation, but he died before he could realize this. And uh, uh, J.R.D. took from this, and he completed the, the dreams of, of Jamshedji, and also uh, had more dreams of his own, which he fulfilled in his lifetime. The Tata Crest was designed by the founder, Jim Shetji, with the words Humat 
hukta, havaista, meaning good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Symbolically, JRD added wings to the crest. I once told him, you believe in excellence, sir, don't you? He corrected me. Not excellent, he said. Perfection. If you aim for perfection, you will attain excellence. If you aim for excellence, you will go somewhere lower down. JRD's early life had numerous shades. Life had many lessons to impart, and young JRD was a quick learner. Humility came to him naturally. He was not a vindictive man. And he forgave also very often. Many people I know hurt him deeply. But he would forgive them. He would write it off. And they could still be his friends. The young JRD schooling was in Paris in French, in Bombay in English, then Paris again before returning to Bombay. Once I asked him, do you think in English or in French? He said, I think in English, but I calculate figures in French because those tables he had learned by heart were in French. After school, JRD was drafted for a year in the French army. Soon after, his father wanted him by his side in Bombay, and formal education came to a halt. This was his greatest and most lingering regret. Basically a sense of his own limitation in the sense that he never went to university. That is what bugged him. Speed and JRD were synonymous. His love for fast-moving cars won him his first and last love, his wife, Thelma. Speeding his way through the streets of Bombay on the Bugatti gifted by his father, JRD soon became marked by the Bombay police. He was compelled to visit Jack Wakaji, a brilliant lawyer who had a beautiful niece, Thelma. Eyes met. Time stopped. J.R.D. was in love, and love culminated in marriage. In earlier times, the Tata Empire operated from Navsari buildings. George Whitet, the man who designed the Gateway of India, designed the headquarters of Tata and Sons off the floor of Fountain in 1921. In 1924, it was inaugurated as Bombay House. JRD joined the Tatas in 1925. He was then sent to Jamshedpur to understand the intricacies of steel, from manufacture to company management. He began as an unpaid apprentice to John Peterson, a retired ICS officer. He sat at a small desk in a corner of Peterson's room, and every paper was rooted through him. He was sent to England to learn English, and then was recalled by his father to go to Jamshedpur and wait outside the general manager's office on a stool to pick up correspondence. Whatever went in, he looked at. Whatever went out, he looked at. And this was his training. In 1926, after his father's death, JRD became the head of his family and the permanent director of Tata Sons at the young age of 22. JRD's vision of industries was the fulfillment of Jamshedji's. In his case, he felt that the first thing was to develop the basic industries, and that's why he concentrated on basic industries. And that's why Tata's also followed over the next many decades in the same position. However, he went beyond this to create an empire that laid great stress on human values and was always concerned with the needs of the people within this family. J.R.D. said, to lead men, you have to lead them with affection. His smile and his presence was felt by all within and outside of his empire. He led by example, his, his touch was a human touch. And uh, whenever he had to deal with the problem that, the, that existed in a company, 
he would bring that perspective of, of a human touch. And quite often, management took positions which he overturned. <laughs> When Jamshedji took up the task of setting up a steel plant in the 1880s, he had a vision that was much ahead of his time. He set up Tata Steel in collaboration with Charles Page Perrin, a geologist and metallurgist of the time. Perrin was sought after in countries across the globe for his knowledge of iron and steel. Tata Steel was India's first integrated steel company. One day, it would be among the world's top steel companies, achieving the lowest cost of production in the world. Today, this has been understood, and basic industries have been built in this country, mainly in the public sector. And that is natural, because they need enormous resources, and that they need uh, the application of, uh, the, of, uh, of certain uh, limitations in the use of resources, in the use of the soil, in mining, in large areas that have to be acquired. But it is, it is right that the state is the, best, uh, is the best kind of organization to develop. JRD had a vision to build the new temples of growth and development. They made steel, but that was not all. We also make steel was the slogan. It's a, it's a kind of person whose memory is very worth celebrating because of his contribution to the economy, because of his contribution also to charity and good social causes, because of his pioneering spirit. The aim of this colossus was to build a highly productive society of even opportunities, a society where work would be a balm for the common masses. He was perhaps the finest creator of attitude in the Indian work ethos. His uh, greatest attribute and his greatest impact uh, that he has left behind on the world has been his extreme commitment to integrity and values. And along with it, his complete lack of arrogance Tata Steel had had a turbulent history of labor unrest with three massive strikes from 1920 to 1928. The management of labor envisaged by JRD was unique. Aggression softened into attention and affection. But JRD was something different. He, he got my loyalty and my devotion to him by virtue of what he was, not by virtue of what he did. JRD believed that companies ought to take greater care of their men rather than their machines. When we were in Bombay, we liked their smile. We liked their smile. We liked their smile. We liked their smile. And they had a charisma that when we were in Bombay, we liked their smile. We liked their smile. He had touched power, but he was untouched by it because of his humility. Any employee who wanted to meet him could walk into his room after taking an appointment and sit and discuss with him any problems that they had. He espoused the principles of an eight-hour working day, free medical aid, workers' provident scheme, and workmen's accident compensation schemes. We are extremely fortunate, those of us who work in the group and in these companies, we're extremely fortunate to have inherited such vision and, along with it, such environment. These were later adopted as statutory requirements in the country. A landmark achievement was in 1975 when the labor and management celebrated 50 years of industrial peace. He became head of Tata Sons in 1938 and perhaps was the first head of an industrial house which celebrated 50 years of unbroken peace and harmony with the trade unions. In 1956, joint departmental councils were established 
to enable the management and labor to sit together at various levels and sort out their differences. Yeah, they had a very human approach. He captured the imagination of his labor and made them his supporters in the endeavor. For instance, the wages which the Tatas paid at that time was the highest in the whole of India. The boss had changed into a leader. It was no longer, you go. Now it was, let's go. Strikes and lockouts never recurred. You've only got to attend some of these consultation meetings, which are being held all the time, at all levels, between at meetings which are attended to by management and labor representatives. On some occasion, it is the labor, the worker who's presiding the meeting. At other time, it's management. You see the, the, the way they talk to each other, the way they joke with each other, even the whole spirit is such. In 1897, Jamshedji had reached the village of Sakchi through the Kalimati railway station. In 1919, Sakchi had been renamed Jamshedpur as a tribute to his contributions to the nation. In JRD's time, it grew to having the best of gardens, clubs and health centers for the citizens. When asked by a friend why he was spending so much on Jamshedpur, he replied, I'm building a city for the workers, not a shed. Jamshedpur, I think what is unique is the fact that this understanding of the role of human relations, and not merely as a, as a, a slogan, but in its, in its daily application, GRD offered an industrial era for the development of a rural society. He believed in rewards for humanity as a whole. Tata Sahab Hamari Akar ke both Hamloko Sayata Kia or my Danubad and Tata Sahapu, or Hamari Kampa be Puchal Rakhewe, or Tata Kitelta Hamlok, or be both Kush. He was a beacon of light for the tribals of Jharkhand. The future had promises of rosier tomorrows and surer dreams. At Tata Steel, we are fulfilling Mr. G.R.D. Tata's vision through three societies. Uh, the Tata Steel Rural Development Society that works for integrated rural development in more than 600 villages and the Tribal Culture Society that works for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities in very urban areas of Jamshedpur, mainstreaming them, bringing them back into the uh, economic and development and also to improve the educational base. Health had always been one of JRD's chief concerns. The Tata Steel Mobile Health Clinic headed its way through untrodden paths to remote and inaccessible villages to provide essential health care to ailing humanity. Earlier, I used to look after around 12,000 patients per year, but now the number has gone down to around 5,000 per year. The incidence of diseases like uh, chronic diseases like tuberculosis and leprosy, which were rampant in the area, has gone down to almost nil. Uh, enhancing quality of life uh, was the dream of uh, even uh, J.R.D. Tata, uh, who was our leader, and I am proud to be the part of the team. Love, dedication, and care soon became the synonym of the Tatars. Jay is a very kind person, and that kindness was there in him. That reflected in his work. JRD's commitment to contribute to the community led to the formation of organizations like the Tata Council for Community Initiatives, which undertakes projects in the fields of education, vocational training, community health, water management, and training teachers in various skills. 
in the form of volunteering today almost 10,000 volunteers live that value actually by serving the society in such a great variety of ways that it can only be singly put as giving the human touch, living and sharing it every moment, every day of one's life. The Tata Institute of Social Science, started in 1936, marked a shift from generic social work to specialized courses of study. It has a tradition of responding to human needs and natural disasters by sending relief teams. Principally the Dorothy Tata Trust were in the areas of medicine, science and technology, like the Tata Cancer Hospital and Center, then uh, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, then uh, the biggest of the whole lot was the Institute of Science in Bangalore, the Indian Institute of Science. JRD was one of the first Indians to foresee the drag that unchecked population growth would have on the country's developmental efforts. He advocated the cause way back in 1951. My speech was not fully appreciated in very high circles. I was told quite clearly that uh, a large population is the greatest source of, of power for any nation. Now, I never think in terms of power, uh, and uh, certainly I think I've always felt that India, yes, should be a great economic power, but no other kind of power. He set up the Family Planning Foundation in 1970 in association with the Ford Foundation. And he believed that, that India's rate of population growth was one of its greatest problems. And however unpopular that may have been in certain quarters, that's what he went after. And he saw that as a problem long before it ever became publicly felt. GRD was primarily concerned with the crisis of want in the developing countries and the crisis of spirit in the Western world. To me, there is no other purpose. Of course, we, well, I wouldn't want that we should have a thousand million people or two thousand million people, but simply that I, can, I have seen all these last 40, 50 years how we have been slowed down in our, at least our per capita income, in our, in our growth of our or of leading to a better life for everybody, almost entirely caused by this increasing population. In recognition of his pragmatic approach, the United Nations honored him with the UN Population Award. A prosperous and happy India was his persistent goal. He could combine a kind of Indian identity, which is at once a world-related global identity, and at the same time has a great sense of national concern and a national pride. His life was a success story, but there was a regret that his country had not asked him for his contribution for her economic development. He wanted quality, he wanted perfection. If something more could be done, he would like to go ahead and do it. He wouldn't like to take that, well, how are we going to do that? He will not take that as an answer. He would like you to go ahead, find a way, get it done. His was not a script of materialism. His was a vision of a society that was different. He was interested in people being happy. Wealth, money, food is all a part of it. But basically, it is the joy of the heart that he was looking for of himself and to give to others. He once said, I don't want India to be an economic superpower. I want it to be a happy country. Jayanti had no illusions about making India a superpower. He, he wanted India to be prosperous. Above all, I think he wanted the people of India to be happy. Jayanti always viewed the interest of the nation over his personal gain. 
he was a mentor for his workers, providing all aid as and when required, including medical facilities. Social injustice was strongly dealt with. JRD didn't build monuments, he built people. JRD was the greatest role model for the coming generations, past generations since him uh, in India. Under this novel style of management, his empire grew by leaps and bounds. Tata Tea, Tata Chemicals, Tata Consultancy Services and Tata Exports were initiated to script success. He guided the destiny of Tata Sun for over half a century, building new companies, pioneering new ventures and ideas and contributing to the transformation of our country from a colonial agrarian economy into a modern industrial economy. 14 companies had grown into 95 companies. 17 crores had grown into 10,000 crores. The conqueror of the world, JRD, selected Ratan, the gem, the man sitting on my right, to carry forward his vision. At work, he was like my surrogate father. Uh, he and I exchanged views. He advised me. He scolded me. He, in many ways, he molded me through the years of contact. I often used to tell him that I was sorry that we didn't get to know each other earlier. At the turn of the 19th century, the Wright brothers had created the first rough cut aeroplane to traverse the virgin sky and etch their names on it. The race had begun. From that first indigenous flight of the Wright brothers till the present day Boeings and Airbuses to the space shuttle, sky travel has come a long way. For GRD, it all began decades ago, when as a 15-year-old, he managed to avail a joyride in a small plane piloted by Vlerio, the first man to fly over the English Channel. The clouds seemed to call. The skies seemed to beckon. The desire to leave the Earth behind was ignited. I found that every other country in the world was developing its commercial aviation. I had a, I had a great, a great desire to, to, to see commercial aviation come into this country and to play a part in it. After failing twice to negotiate with the government, JRD managed to triumph in his endeavor. Tata Airlines was born, and the first Indian pilot was at the controls of a tiny plane, a Pusmat, that rose on the eastern horizon one October morning. I asked him which was your happiest moment in life. He said, when I was given my first solo flight. And the instructor said, now you're on your own. The 15th of October, 1932. JRD had left his thumb impression on the azure sky. We cannot reach the stars, he said, but like mariners of the sea, we chart our course by them. We both shared the same passion for flying. Uh, I, he did more than I did in, in a more adventurous time in aviation than, than I had. But both of us have, uh, have shared this passion. In 1933, the first full year of operations, Tata Airlines flew 160,000 miles, carried 155 passengers, and 10.71 tons of mail. The passage of time saw many a technological advancement. The sky expanded. Boeings and Airbuses flew beyond the seven seas with the spirit of JRD at the controls. He knew everything about the airline. Every little detail he said interested me. It was not just the joy of flying. 29th of July, 1946, Tata Airlines became the Air India we know today. The journey of Air India continued. It was almost a spiritual journey punctuated by many twists and turns. As the little Maharaja, who first appeared as a symbol on a notepad in the mid-40s, began to appear all over the world. 
the airline's historic and amazing airlifting of 110,000 stranded Indian nationals from Amman to Mumbai during August-October 1990 was recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest evacuation of civilians. I have myself seen him cleaning himself the first-class toilets. And when I approached him and I told him, sir, no, please don't do it. He said, no, I know you all are busy, but this is my airline and I'll do what, what is best for it. On the 1st of August, 1953, JRD became the chairman of Air India. Later, it came in as no surprise in India when JRD was unanimously elected chairman of both the domestic and the international airline. Achievement followed achievement for half a century. He established a world-class airline, which other airlines turned to uh, for inspiration and used as a model. And he kept those standards all the time that he led Air India until he was removed. And he continued to be totally updated on technology relate, relating to aviation. And it was very much his passion and part of his life. At the age of 78, in 1982, he successfully piloted a flight from Bombay to Karachi, earmarking the golden jubilee of his life in aviation. His passion for flying contributed to his being the first Indian to fly an aircraft from Karachi to Mumbai, launching India's civil aviation industry. He built Air India into an airline of global repute. Thus, one step at the controls of a roughshod aircraft was in 1932 and the other in 1982. The real merit of the performance that I have put in today in uh, flying day before yesterday and coming, bringing back today uh, a perfectly safe and sound aeroplane. An old lady, it is true, but you get on very well with her old pilot. From childhood, I was crazy about flying. Always wanted the day to come when I would fly myself. His removal from Air India was quite devastating for him. Uh, he may not have shown it very much. I happened to have been with him in Jamshedpur when he opened the morning papers because he was humiliated by having to read about his removal in the newspapers. And I was with him that morning. And he was really crestfallen. Indira Gandhi, who was soon to become India's Prime Minister again, wrote to JRD, Jay, we are proud of you and of the airline. No one can take the satisfaction from you, nor belittle the government's debt to you in this respect. A humble, uh, what should I say, apology to the government of India, to the postal authorities, to civil aviation, to the uh, chiefs of Air India, because I felt that, I feared that the event of uh, a half a century, the golden jubilee of Indian air transport and of Air India might not be treated as anything of importance. I was wrong. I was in Delhi in 1944 winter and I had a job here. I was frustrated with the job and I wanted to get out of it. So I remember one cold night in Delhi. I, I was staying in the South India boarding house and I wrote a letter to J.R.D. Tata which was in the way of an application for a Tata scholarship for abroad. I slept over it, and the next morning, I decided to send the scratch letter in the original form to JRD. That is my first contact with him. And I was surprised when I got a reply to that letter after a few weeks, asking for me to come to Bombay House in Bombay for an interview. So I went there. That is the first time I had a glimpse of it. JRD was like a water diviner when it came to discovering talent. In the field of science, JRD was the first to visualize a strong and nuclear India. 
He funded the early work of Homi Bhabha and helped India's nuclear program. And in 1945, set up the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which, in Dr. Bhabha's words, was to become the cradle of India's atomic energy program. His commitment to nation building manifested itself in a variety of ways. He took keen interest in family planning. He liberally funded the preservation and development of Indian art and craft. He invested time and money in the intellectual development of our youth. Apart from building his companies like Telco, he built national institutions like Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore. The Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore is deemed a university and serves as a window to the external world to gauge the competence of research and development related to science, engineering and technology in India. The Nobel laureate Dr. C. V. Raman, Dr. Homi Bhabha and Dr. Vikram Sarabhai are some of the luminaries associated with this institute. JRD's daring spirit did not limit itself to flying single-handedly on a small plane. It was there to fight against the most lethal disease of all times, cancer. The Tata Memorial Hospital became the first ever hospital in India that specialized in the treatment of cancer. This hospital excels in service and dedication. Mr. JRD Tata in particular uh, I think uh, was, uh, was always uh, delighted to come to the Tata Memorial Hospital. It gave him a wonderful sense of pride and a, a wonderful sense of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, satisfaction that the ordinary man in this country, man and woman in this country, uh, would be given uh, sophisticated cancer treatment, state-of-the-art cancer treatment, uh, which he deserved regardless of whether they could pay for it or not. Tata Memorial Center was yet another big dream of JRD that fructified into reality. The hospital was inaugurated on 28th of February 1941 and has since spearheaded an untiring war on cancer in this country. It not only provides specialized treatment but also serves as a launching pad for new methods of treatment and diagnosis throughout the country. The story of automobiles in India has been scripted by JRD. Tata Motors was the first automobile factory in India. It has served the nation with trucks, cars, ambulances, utility vehicles, and defense vehicles across the length and breadth of our country, on good or bad roads, through cities, and rough terrain. In 1897, Jim Shetji was not allowed to enter a hotel managed by the British as he was an Indian. His motto was, never react to an insult, give a reply. It led to the opening of the Taj Hotel in Bombay in 1903. The original Taj Mahal was the Emperor Shah Jahan's dream in marble, born out of his love for his wife. Jamshedji's handiwork was born out of love for his city. When the Taj Hotel was opened, it was recognized as one of the best in the world. Facing the mouth of the harbour, the Taj stood in its solitary grandeur as the gateway of India was yet to be built. Uh, he had that sort of very childlike um, uh, quality about him. And he was such a, such a thorough gentleman, so caring for people. 
uh, he would always ask, as soon as he would check into the hotel, he'd say, so dear, how are you? And of course I'd say, well, the hotel is doing very well and you know, the occupancy. He said, no dear, I asked, how are you? During his regime, JRD opened new dimensions and set greater standards of service and hospitality. He brought everything that he had inculcated into Air India into Indian Hotels Company. So if we were doing uniforms, he would tell us how to walk, how to dress. He would even uh, pick the saris for us. The service excellence that we started in Taj started with Mr. Jayadi Tata. It has since expanded into a chain of hotels, which have become synonymous with quality, elegance, and beauty. One day when he was in Calcutta, he was not well and he was coming down some stairs. So I gave him my arm and I said, uh, why don't you hold on to my arm and come down? And he said, in all my life, I have always given a lady my arm. I'm not going to hold your arm. So I had to say, OK, then let me hold your arm and come down with you just to make sure that he wouldn't have a fall because he was rather unwell. The industrialist was also a man of creativity and culture. Jayadi, in association with J.J. Bhava, created the NCPA, the National Center for Performing Arts, on the 8th of June, 1966. We were allowed to start the National Center for the Performing Arts in borrowed premises. And at that time, the Prime Minister herself, Indira Gandhi, came to inaugurate the set. And she spoke very, in very encouraging and glowing terms. And then at that same occasion, J.R.D. Tata also spoke in very beautiful and encouraging terms about my efforts to start this National Center for the Performing Arts. For the preservation and promotion of India's rich legacy of classical, traditional, and contemporary performing and visual arts. I had suggested to propose to the group chairman then that, you know, we've done all these wonderful independent institutions. They're all of national importance, but they're all in the areas of medicine, science, and technology. And I said, there is need also for something equally important in the areas of the arts and humanities, which has not yet been done. An additional objective was to disseminate knowledge, promote appreciation, provide training, and sponsor or undertake scientific research in these fields. At Bombay, land was not available. But, said the dynamic duo, the sea was. The layout and the auditorium display the taste and excellence of these two men. The Jamshed Bhabha Theatre, inaugurated by the President of India, shows the existence of art in the very essence of this multifaceted personality. The exotic theatre has seen many legendary maestros perform. <laughs> J.R.D. laid great value on physical fitness and encouraged men and women to scale new heights. He guided the policies and activities of the Tata Sports Club for over 50 years as its president. And I think that more, more sports and, and physical exercises and walking and running and living young, even when one is old, would do a lot to improve the, uh, both the spirit and the health of our people. The Tata Football Academy was the first of its kind. Archery was another sport which J.R.D. patronized. He inspired tribals to take up the challenge of this sport. I have been very fortunate to interact with Mr. J.R.D. as a sportsman in my younger days. And every year during the Tata Intercompany meet in Bombay, he made it a point to visit the sporting field and spend two, three hours with the sports person. It is this love for sports today that the stadium is named after him, uh, Mr. J.R.D. Tata himself who was a great lover of children, a great lover of sports. And above all, we have been very fortunate to be able to interact with a person of his stature. The cricket center of the GRD Sports Complex 
has been a passport to fame for many youngsters. Adventure sports have been given new heights. Now when I climbed Mount Everest in 1984, I had uh, carried with me that uh, uh, Tata flag to the top of the world. So after coming back, I had that great opportunity to meet Maharaj Atnajiyadi Tata at Bombay House and I handed over that, that flag to Jiyadi uh, Tata. Mahatma Gandhi ne kaha tha, Tata's represent the true spirit of adventure. And we are Tata Steel Adventure Foundation to keep alive that spirit which uh, G.R.D. Tata has in his lifetime. He was a great adventurous and adventurous. So we are alive with that spirit. G.R.D. was an achiever and unstoppable. He was a colossus in his own right. I was a novice. In that particular field, I didn't know. An ordinary public worker uh, could not really comprehend the kind of sweep that the man had in his mind. But I tried to. This I must say uh, that he made me, made me understand, appreciate, uh, have some idea of the sweep and uh, to that extent I stood benefit. At the age of 40, he took up skiing and excelled. But the desire to achieve more left his spirit restless. I said, sir, why are you always restless? Oh, I appear restless, but I'm at peace with him. He told me that. I, I told him, I said, why are you always restless? You know, I'm at peace with him. Short-tempered in his youth, he tempered his temper with the passage of time and transformed himself into a man of concern and compassion. If he slighted anybody, he did not take long to make amends. It was difficult to get into him, but then once you once he saw the wisdom, he will say, you know, what he's saying is right. We should do that. He was the center of attention at any public or social gathering. He was very charming. He had a marvelous charisma. Both men and women always loved and respected him. J.R.D. had a quirky sense of humor. In 1991, when he was going to the U.S. for his heart treatment, he told his friend and biographer, Rusi Lala. Nobody is interested in what happens to me. So I felt, I took it seriously. I, I, I turned back and I looked at him and I turned again to, to leave. I didn't know what to say. And then he says from the back, except the ladies. So I said, whose hearts you have broken? No, whose favors I seek. A man of 86. You know, that, that sparkle was in him. Jay had a tremendous sense of humor, a natural sense of humor. He had a little black book in which he had many prompts to jokes. And one night, sitting with a colleague in a restaurant outside Geneva, he regaled us maybe for an hour and a half going through this book with joke after joke after joke, which are all very funny, all clean. He had his little eccentricities. Even at a public meeting, if they put garlands around his head, which annoyed him and ruffled his hair, he would quickly, he had a pair of uh, his hair coat, he would quickly do it up again. You know, you dare not upset my... J.R.D. had a passion for poetry from his teenage years. Two themes, love and death, dominated his reading. Whenever we met, we met with... Uh, uh, great respect and uh, as you know it's not just uh, like your generation is always a kind of veneration always a kind of uh, if you call it a barrier between generations nevertheless he was very friendly his behavior was as if he was 
talk it to one of his pawns. So that's what I found the human quality in man. And that always impresses. Bharat Ratna, Sri Jahangir Ratanji, Dada Bhai Tata. India's highest civilian award, the Bharat Ratna, Jewel of India, was conferred on JRD in 1992 for his great contribution in the industrialization and social welfare of a modern India. In life, honor seldom go to be deserving. But uh, the instance of J.R.D. Tata was unique and exceptional. He was awarded the Bharat Ratna for his multifaceted services to the country. In fact, as president, I had uh, something to do with that award. My feeling was that uh, everybody in the particular field in which they excel must be entitled to the highest award. The noted journalist N. V. Kamath wrote in his editorial that the government of India had shown great acumen in conferring this award to a non-political personality during his lifetime. The whole of India was happy. It was an extraordinary step to give Bharat Ratna to a private businessman. That was the government was going out of his way and recognized, recognizing as a private individual as Bharat Ratna, which was a unique honor which we have not given to anyone else since. That. For me, personally, it was a moment of great pride and satisfaction. When I think of J.R.D. Tata, the word that springs to my mind is the word first. He was first in many things. He was the first in aviation, first to note that businesses must take care of men and women more than they take care of their machines. 1921 the first pilot in India. 1932, he started the first civil aviation flight in India. 1953, the first chairman of Air India. 1954, recipient of the Legion of Honor from France. 1964, Papal Honor, Knight Commander of the Order of St. Gregory. 1975, Jahangir Gandhi Medal for Industrial Peace. 1978, Knight Commander's Cross of the Order of Germany. 1979, recipient of the Tony Janus Award for Commercial Aviation. 1985, Gold Air Medal from the Federation Aeronautique Internationale. 1986, Henry Bessemer Gold Medal for his contribution to the iron and steel industry. 1988, the Daniel Guggenheim Medal. To date, JRD is the third international awardee. The first two recipients were the Wright brothers and Charles Lindbergh. 1992, the first Indian to receive the United Nations Population Award. 1992, the first industrialist to receive the Bharat Ratna during his lifetime. He could not stop for death, so death gently stopped for him. Sometimes you discuss with me, when I come back in my next life, where should I be born? Should it be Russia? I don't think I'm too interested in being born in the West. It's not challenging enough. Maybe I'll come back to India. So there's so much to do here. He quietly and gracefully passed away one wintry day in a hospital in Geneva on the 29th of November, 1993. His mortal remains were interred in the Tata family mausoleum at a cemetery in Paris. I'm absolutely delighted that there is this attempt to this, this occasion, on this occasion to remember what J.R.D. Tata did for the country. J.R.D. Tata 
was not a daredevil, but he had a daring spirit. It is that spirit which took him to such great heights. He had a great love for people. And when you love people, you bring them closer to God. Jay was an achiever all through his life. He didn't like to be second or third. He wanted to be the best. Human, friendly, concerned, even affectionate. To me, he's the ideal man. I thought he was a very forbidding figure, but he was far from that. He was a very friendly, humble person, like an ordinary person. He was very human. Today, perhaps, we need many more Jayadi Tatas. He was one of those great men who has set the example to humanity. On Jayadi's birth centenary, I urge every Indian businessman, professional, citizen, to seek inspiration from Jayadi's life and commitment to the building of a modern, prosperous, humane India. An era had ended, but the firebird lives on. His dauntless spirit hovers eternally somewhere beyond the last blue mountain. We are the pilgrims, Master. We should go always a little further. It may be beyond that last blue mountain barred with snow, across that anguish or that glimmering sea.